you said something insightful that not enough people realize is that agriculture is probably the number one most influential um, development in human history, period. The, and, and it sounds like such a stupid thought. I can plant a seed and something grows where I plant it. But that that's we're the only animals that really have a robust view of that notion. Um, you know, if it's second to anything, it's fire. Maybe. You know what I mean? It's a huge development um, and is the backbone of all civilizations. Sure. Um, and continue. And we ignore it at our peril. That is true. I'll, I'll grant you that. Hello and welcome to Talk Ag to Me, the podcast dedicated to improving ag literacy around the globe. I'm your host, Brandon Black, and today's episode is all about the urban-rural split. Yes, this is the first episode of the new mini-series we're working on, on my theories around why this split is occurring and whether or not we should do anything about it. To help me with this episode, I have a special guest by the name of Taylor. I'm going to allow him to introduce himself and any projects he's working on. Go ahead, Taylor. Sure. So my name is Taylor Eland. Um, I, first and foremost, I'm a California. Californian, uh, born and raised, not born and raised, but raised in the Central Valley and I've spent time in San Diego and more recently up in Washington State, actually. Uh, I am now at this point a law graduate of a Bachelor of Science in Biology because I have all kinds of different interests. And, you know, the pet project that I go around, you know, masquerading as a, as a mascot for mm -hmm. is my podcast as well. Um, it's a political podcast. And I, you know, I'm happy to talk more about that at the end of the show because I don't want to distract people with politics <laughs> at this point. But I do run a political podcast, uh, so you can see where my bent view is coming from. Awesome. I'm glad to hear it. And, you know, we, in this podcast, we don't necessarily, you know, always dive into the politics, but as, as everyone knows, politics kind of dives into everything. And especially Unfortunately. With, <laughs> right. Especially with agriculture and the allocation of resources, politics is going to play a role, and it does pertain to our conversation today, which is why I was happy to have you on here. So, uh, I'm, you know, just jumping straight into it. If you wouldn't mind kind of, you know, explaining what your background and experience is with agriculture. Uh, you mentioned you live in California, same as me. We actually found out that we're in very similar areas. So if you can kind of just kind of let our audience know where, you know, where your agricultural knowledge or background comes from. Um, sure. So as uh, uh, for like the strictly agricultural side of things, I, I am an observer at best. Um, mm. I, you know, I, I eat the food agriculture produces. I enjoy the cows. I enjoy the chicken. I enjoy the the, the vegetables and the fruits and all that. Like, it's not like I, I have any expertise in agriculture per se. Mm. Uh, I am educated though with a bachelor of science in biology at a school that primarily did a 50, 50 split between cellular biology and ecological biology, biology. So I actually know a decent amount about plants and some of the different stuff that can go through that. And therefore I have the understanding of how agriculture culture works as a local fresnan um you know it, it, it permeates our life because ag is huge where i'm from and it, it, you learn about it you know as cursory to just living life mm -hmm. um so i of course am familiar with like the almond farms that are around here the our history as a raisin in the world you know the central valley is often been called the breadbasket of the world mm -hmm. we supply a, a large portion of the food for the united states if not the entirety of the world and that's a huge thing and something to be proud of, uh, which obviously from my more political side of things and legal side of things dictates the laws we have. It dictates the policies that um, the state has implemented. It dictates the water crisis, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, um, among other things. I'm going to I come from this topic, not so much as an experienced farmer, but as a reasonably educated outsider um, who is surrounded through by the topic and you know appreciates all the good work that the agriculture industry does um, i want to say agriculture is it's important to know about it and all that so that's my background Awesome. Well, I'm glad to hear it. And uh, you, you know, made us all a point about not being necessarily, you know, an expert in the field, but you have, you know, you have a firsthand view of how a lot of the op op operations in the area function and that sort of thing. And that's perfect. I mean, the entire point of this episode and, and you know, the, the first part of this theory is to basically just have somebody to 
talk about my thoughts with and kind of hear their perspective on the urban rural split and kind of you know the 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 general context surrounding it and i'm 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 already almost certain this isn't going to be the only episode i'm going to cover on this so it's nice to hear different perspectives of different people especially someone who grew up in my area because you're probably going to have very similar perspectives on things that, that i'm going to have and i'm kind of curious to see what your thoughts are especially from the political side of things so of course all right. <laughs> so I guess the best way to kind of start this off is to lay down what my thoughts are on the urban rural split, and then we, we can hop into kind of your views on it, and we can, you know, start start the discussion from there. So the reason that I've, I've been developing this theory is because since my days in high school, when I was, uh, you know, speaking and, and doing other, uh, you know, public speaking events and other, and other you know, large scale uh, representation, or not representation, education events, um, I have noticed that there's kind of a common trend in agricultural issues. That trend being, well, first of all, like you mentioned, there's the water situation and there's, you know, regulations and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of the issues that I've, I've noticed in agriculture kind of boil back down to the general public not knowing enough about where their food comes from. And that causes fear. It causes, you know, a misunderstanding that causes voting to, to, you know, push regulations one way or the other. It causes shifts in markets. I mean, there's, there's a variety of different things that are caused by this lack of understanding. And more than anything, it causes kind of a, a social schism between rural communities and urban communities. And, and even, you know, even within urban communities, there are, there are even schisms. And, and we talked about that briefly before the episode as well. Um, but, I think that the reason that this is an important topic to talk about is because agriculture, as we've talked about before on the podcast, founded the first society. That was the reason that the first civilization was, was established was because they could grow a sustainable source of food. As society has developed, they've grown away from that source of food and become less stable because of it. And so I have this theory that agriculture provides stability to society. And by creating this urban rural split, it's, it's actually... It's dividing people in more ways than just political. It's it's creating this, uh, you know, this false narrative that the food that we're eating is not is not good, that it's not safe, that it's you know grown using all these you know dangerous chemicals and robotics and all kinds of weird stuff that's not really all that accurate. Um, that you know the the people who live in the cities are completely against agriculture, and you know that's not even entirely accurate. It basically it's it's created it's created these almost like straw man personalities of both sides. And so both sides hate each other now for really no reason. And so I kind of wanted to dive more into, you know, first of all, what the urban rural split is, you know, you know J uh, Taylor, if you've seen you know, is examples of it and kind of why, you, why you think that that's starting to occur or, or has been occurring. Well, okay. So the, the urban rural split is uh, complicated. It's complicated. Yes. Um, and, and it's, and it's not as simple as like, like, it's not necessarily true that it's, it's only like, it's happened in on this like linear scale where we become less urban or less or rural, rural, rural as time goes on. It turns out history tends to go in cycles. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we actually, a great case study for this, as you continue your theory is to actually flesh out, um, r the Roman empire and their, their cyclical nature between becoming more of an urbanized society versus a, a, uh, a more, uh, rural one. And mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like linear there either they actually went through in cycles it's my understanding hmm. um so i grew up in a small town that was very rural uh and there there is certainly a cultural difference for a number of reasons uh, it wasn't an ag-based town but there are different there are differences there and you know even among urban communities like you alluded to before there are differences among urban communities so i do think there are obviously stages to this um, i've spent time in spokane washington which is not quite like fresno california um, and I've spent time in San Diego, which Fresno is nothing like that. And the 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 rural urban split, you know, like most things, comes down to misunderstanding. Uh, it comes down to you know different needs, different desires, different issues that you have to handle with. Rural people don't have to worry as much about crime because it's rural. You know, you you have your shotgun, you have your you you have the means to protect yourself. Calling the cops is not an option. It's not a concern for you. It's, it's not very densely populated. You don't have to worry about people rubbernecking and all that kind of stuff where, you know, urban, that's more of a concern. Um, but a concern that, the, that urbanites don't tend to have is, you know, protecting wildlife or animal control or any of these other things that, you know, might be more relevant to, to more rural communities. So it, as with most things, especially politically, it comes down to this political uh, misunderstanding that, you know, over the last century, sure, it looks more linear um, because we have been 
thankfully, like this is this is a miracle of technology. We don't all have to break our backs um, doing the hard work of farming. I mean, the the if I go to the town to the fields that are um, east of Fresno, where where my parents are, and, and watching the, the older women who are bent over every time I see them picking strawberries. I, I don't want to be doing that. I'm sorry. And that's that's a product of you know urbanization. That's a product of the industrial revolution and all the different revolutions that have been following it. And through this, you know, general split away from the way that we view the world, it's just people don't talk to other people. I think it's really that simple. Um, so I, I think that's a good starting point. You know, I, I, I hesitate to say it's linear. I, it, it is more cyclical. Societies have, they do this thing where they kind of go back and forth. We've seen flashes of it recently with uh, hydroponics and, you know, other urban ways of growing stuff. People often start gardens in their, in their urban backyards. Um, so, you know, it, it turns out that history, well, whether it's evolutionary, whether it's just human nature, whatever you want to call it, uh, we, we tend to want to stick with the ground, uh, some level, lots of humans find, you know, find a connection with the stuff that they can grow. You, said something insightful that not enough people realize is that agriculture is probably the number one most influential um, development in human history, period. The, the, and, and it sounds like such a stupid thought. I can plant a seed and something grows where I plant it. But that that's we're the only animals that really have a robust view of that notion. Um, you know, if it's second to anything, it's fire. Maybe. You know what I mean? It, it's... A huge development um, and is the backbone of all civilizations sure um and continue and we ignore it at our peril that is true i'll, I'll grant you that yeah so i think that you know i think you made a lot of solid points there uh one thing that i really wanted to highlight that you had mentioned was the cyclical nature of of just history and i think that that's a, you know that is a really important thing to realize because something that i've highlighted a couple of times on this podcast is that i came from a community where I was basically told my whole life that people who don't, uh, who aren't raised around agriculture don't support it. Basically like those who, who were raised specifically in urban areas and have never been exposed to agriculture are automatically going to be hesitant to trust agriculture. After moving to an urban area, and after, you know, working on the podcast for a few years and kind of talking to people about stuff like that, I've begun to realize that that's not exactly true. And that actually the opposite is true that a lot of people in urban areas are very curious about agriculture and some even in, involve themselves in agricultural practices like gardening, like you had mentioned. And it becomes almost like um, a fad's not quite the right word, but like, you know, it almost becomes like the cool thing to do is like now everyone's involved in agriculture, but they don't realize that what they're doing is not what we're doing on the farms back home kind of thing. And when they learn right. about all of the new technology and the new methods and all of the new you know things that are happening in the industry, it just blows their mind. I mean, I've had episodes talking about robots and artificial intelligence and all that kind of stuff that we're using on the farms. And some people can't even fathom the fact that, you know, this supposedly primitive industry is more advanced than half the industries that, that give them the products that they use on a daily basis. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and, and that was, I thought that was kind of funny that, you know, they're returning to agriculture, but they're almost returning to it with this mindset that it is a lot less advanced than it actually is. And that's even creating some problems in terms of communication, but it's not that it's not that they're making decisions that are negatively affecting agriculture because they think it's so primitive. It's that they don't know about what's going on. So then they go in with this false, you know, th with this false idea of what to expect. And then those in agriculture almost kind of not necessarily to take offense to it, but they kind of don't really, you know, they, they, they almost kind of assume that they're being called stupid because they, they, you know, they were perceived to be less advanced than they actually are. And that can cause a lot of communication issues because, you know, anytime, you know, if, if I were to go to a civilization that I've never been to before and I said, oh, you guys are a lot more advanced than I thought you were, that's probably not going to come across super well. <laughs> no, it doesn't go across well, it turns out. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, to, to your point about, about, history being cyclical, I think that, you know, urban communities are slowly returning to agriculture to a degree. It's just that the, the agricultural community almost hasn't done the best job of welcoming them. And we're starting to just get back into that as well, too. And I think a big part of that has been the fact that agriculture has been so disconnected from social media and the internet for so long, that a lot of people that aren't looking for it, do, you know, they don't really have a connection to agriculture. And so that can right. cause a lot of, you know, a lot of disparities in communication that obviously, as we mentioned, communication issues cause, you know, larger scale issues. 
Right. And, you know, people walk around with their baggage of however they view the world. People are ultimately just experiences of their life. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you you can boil down anyone's issues or achievements or anything to what they've experienced in their life if you look deep enough. And, you know, when you grow up in a city, you grow up in, you know, even a city like Fresno, where you can be quite uh, insulated from the agricultural world, even though it surrounds you. Mm -hmm. When you grow up, not really, you know, working with this part of the world, you you don't know how to talk about it. You don't, you don't know what you're talking about. And and honestly, in those cases, the best thing to do is to not talk about it. The experts, you know, say what they're going to say. And, you know, for better or for worse, people sometimes do that. Sometimes they don't, They, they form opinions. So, you know, as far as like, welcoming or understanding or any of that things people are ultimately the byproducts of how they walk about their lives when you're not surrounded by the stuff you're, you're not going to have to handle these conversations with any sort of um real on the central valley to you know to be to feed it and they don't know how to talk to a farmer. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's not, that's not a bad thing. I think oftentimes in society, we get stuck in this notion that if we don't know something that must be bad, right. uh, we're just, we're creatures that deal with generalizations. You know, our, our, our brains create a little tricks to make our lives easier, our being our individual lives easier, not even our collective or our communities, but our lives easier. So if we don't encounter something, we just assume it's like everything else. Mm-hmm. So they assume that, you know, what's important to them is also important to farmers and the farmers likely do the same thing back. Um, and this is not true. And, you know, if people did a better job of understanding the nuances and background, uh, we, the, the split that the, you know, the rural urban split kind of alludes to in society would be less dramatic and not so hostile. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that, you know, it's, it's easy for people involved in agriculture to automatically blame people who aren't coming and talking to them but one thing that i've noticed since kind of you know stepping outside of my comfort zone and talking to those outside of my own community is that a lot of people who are involved in agriculture even are are even you know pretty close-minded to the idea of letting people in that aren't from that background um you know i've I've talked to farmers especially like you know kind of the older generation of 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 farmers that they're very much like this is my practice and you're not going to look at it because i don't want you to steal it kind of that kind of mentality it can cause a lot of complications with, you know, you know, let's just say somebody wants to learn about, you know, how somebody slaughters cows. And he's like, no, I'm not going to show you. Well, that's going to create a lot of suspicion. People are going to be like, why aren't you showing me? Are are you doing something bad? Are you doing something that I shouldn't see, you know? And that causes, you know, when you have one party who wasn't raised around that and they're told they're not allowed to see it. And one party who was raised around that and they were told that if they showed anybody, it would just cause problems. Then you're going to start causing problems just out of that mentality alone. I mean, I've noticed, you know, a lot, a lot more frequently, younger generations of farmers are allowing people to come onto their farms and tour them. And that's lowered the rates of those people distrusting agriculture. I don't exactly have numbers on it because they're, they're more firsthand experiences, but um, you know, there, there have been, you know, physical signs of people becoming more comfortable around agriculture just by being exposed to it more and more. And so it's, it's almost kind of, you know, it, it shows just how much, people were, were not necessarily locked out of it, but like, you know, they, they were kind of, you know, they were put in their bubble for a reason and, and agriculture kept its own bubble for a reason. And the two never intermingled because it was almost like they were forbidden from, from intermingling. And now that they are, again, it's, it's starting to be kind of awkward for, for those conversations to happen. But as they are, it's becoming gradually easier to, to incorporate. And I hope that that continues right. to be the trend. You know, you, you touched upon a couple of things and like the, the mentality that you alluded to for the older generation is actually a well, it, it, it's a well-intentioned mm-hmm. um, because the, these people have been burned. Right. You know what I mean? Like if it, as somebody who recently graduated law school, not an attorney yet, not legal advice, <laughs> come back to me in a couple of months. Um, you know, the copyright laws, patent mm-hmm. laws, uh, trademark, not, well, it's copyright, trademark. And then uh, what's the one I really want? Uh, uh, Trade secrets. There it is. Mm. Uh, trade secret uh, litigation and stuff like that. Like, there's a there's actually a really good reason why they're thinking the way they're thinking, um, and, and it's to protect their bottom line. I think a huge part of the of the issue with cultural divides, especially between rural and urban, which 
agriculture fits more in the rural side of things, right. um, is that typically speaking, and I understand this is changing rapidly, but typically speaking, uh, urban populations tend to be more college educated, mm -hmm. um, they, which in turn makes them more elitist. I say this as somebody with a JD, I'm elitist. Um, it's just the, it's just the nature of being a highly educated individual, mm -hmm. you know, and they and they go on, they go out outside of their, their realm and they, they, they think they know the world and urban people think they know the world because they live in these complex society, you know, societal structures that are much more complicated than a farm. And that that's, well, outside of very recently, that's just true. You know, right. cities are more complicated than farms, generally speaking, um, or at least most people's images of farms. Right. So, you know, they, they think they know it all and they come in and they commandeer, they want to take over, you know, they have these billion dollar companies buying these farms, turning them into these massive uh, corporate production facilities yeah you, you can understand why somebody who's born raised and has been a farmer for 60 years doesn't trust the urban people frankly i wouldn't either like <laughs> it, there, there's what's what's funny about this you know the split is that there are kernels of truth on both sides like right. it's not it's not that the urban people tend to want to commandeer and squash the the rural people they're, they're trying to help mm -hmm. um but they don't understand that a a lot of the times they're wrong uh <laughs> Turns out people aren't very good at solving problems. It, it, that's why it's taken us as long as it has to get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. um, but also, B, sometimes not only are they just wrong, but like even the way you, you, communication is huge. And you, mm -hmm. you've touched on that a lot already. I can tell that you've been thinking about it. Um, they're just trashy communicators. I mean, how you and I can talk as, as products of the university system, you know, is different than how somebody who didn't graduate high school uh, 60 years ago and is still farming talks and right. we, we it's not that they're different levels like one's worse than the other um because that's not true but they're just they're they're different and they there's not much overlap so the conversations that people are having when they try and cross the divide may seem like commonplace for you and i or for them but when you mix it doesn't work right the and water thing is actually a great example of this mm -hmm. yes absolutely and that's kind of we can get to the water thing here momentarily but that was kind of a a big thing that I've been trying to focus on with the podcast is kind of almost being a translator between the two, you know, because to your point, you know, as, as we've both been a product of the university system, we have an understanding of the, you know, educated world, whereas a 60 year old farmer who, who either, you know, barely graduated high school or, or maybe has like some community college experience, they have almost like a completely different vernacular. They may be, live in the same city as, as some of these urban dwellers and they have a very, different vocabulary than them and it's like you said it's not like a less educated and wealth of knowledge right exactly so like you know that you know let's just say you know i come from 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 a college for example thinking i'm all high and mighty because i've learned all this stuff about all these different topics i'm never going to use in my job i go onto a farm and the farmer's asking me to you know uh ai a cow and and to you know check if she has mastitis and to you know push her along with with the other cows to make sure that they get broken properly into the milking machine I'm not going to know what he's talking about. I mean, I do, but like most, you know, most urban people that just came from college aren't right. going to know what he's talking about. It's not because what he's saying is unintelligent. And he's actually saying an incredibly intelligent thing. He has a very complex understanding of, of the biological processes that go into milk production, but they don't know that because they don't speak his language. You know, it's a very different, and that's why I've said forever, agriculture has kind of a, almost their own elitist mentality of, you know, you didn't grow up with us, therefore you don't belong in our, in our culture. And so they created this it's tribal, right? Exactly. You know, they, they created this, this vocabulary around like, this is our industry. And if you can't speak our language then you probably aren't going to understand when in reality, it's very understandable by, you know, biological yeah. terminology that people just don't know because they're not taught that in school. And, you know, if, if you don't know it, why are you expected to to you know to side with these guys who are speaking it you know like i've said forever that if if those in the agriculture industry just use vocabulary that is, is generally understandable for most people then it would be a lot easier for for the communication to happen and that's what i've been trying to do is basically translate agriculture into urban language and translate urban language into agriculture that way the two can actually have a conversation and not get mad at each other for it Right. And you do have individuals uh, who are trying to push this notion that urban farming is the future with, you know, large sky rises of floors just filled with, you know, lighting apparatuses and plates right. of stuff. Um, and that's before you even get into the cellular stuff that they're doing with like the impossible meat, whatever. Right. So, yeah, no, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's a noble task, um, you know, and 
we've we've seen this we see this in all kinds of things realistically people should be better and i know that the, that the term expert is charged nowadays mm. but people should really do, be better about letting experts the actual definition of that of particular fields running their own fields mm -hmm. uh, like we, we we're both from california uh, california whether you like it or hate it doesn't matter uh, is is regulation heavy yes. right so and what the, the problem is is that so many of these regulations if not all of them are not written by farmers now there's a reason why we don't want them to write all the regulations because conflict of interest blah 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 blah, blah. yeah okay sure but uh in the same token i'm biologically trained a little removed uh legally trained and you know a lot of these regulations or laws or whatever written by attorneys who don't know what they're doing so it's like there needs to be more of of a tolerance for people who are smarter than you in the task of which they are working on uh for people to step aside and let them do that task which college educated people are terrible at doing we think we know it all and it's just the reality of the world and humans think they know everything and we don't and in fact turns out we don't know anything but people have a hard time stepping aside, letting somebody smarter than themselves, I have this issue all the time, um, handle the task that's in front of them because they don't want their egos to be hurt. And that's a huge part of, again, rural urban split, left, right split, whatever split you want to call, it's really an issue of people just not letting people with expertise do what they need to do. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And that's, you know, that's one of the biggest challenges to agriculture in California. Whenever I tell people I'm from California and I'm involved in agriculture, they kind of always look at me funny because they don't realize that California even partakes in agriculture, despite being the breadbasket of the world, as you mentioned earlier. Um, it's in a lot of the reasons California why, is more than LA people. Right. And that's, you know, that's, that's one of the biggest things is people think like, you know, oh, we're just LA and San Francisco. It's like, no, no, no. Most of California is agricultural land and we just have a couple big cities. That's yep. about it. Like, it's, you know, it's the same mentality as New York. New York has New York City and the rest is agricultural land. Like that's pretty much it. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's that same mentality of, you know, people just have a false perception of what's actually happening besides this, behind the scenes. Um, but back to your, you know, back to your talk about regulations. That's one of the things that's driving so many farmers away from California is overregulation. Like, you know, I think that most people can agree that regulations are necessary to a degree. Like, I think that, you know, in order to, to have a, a wealth driving society, regulations have to be in place. The problem is not regulations, it's over regulations. It's, you know, it's, it's running farms into the ground because they can't, they can't survive off of the, you know, between the markets and the regulations, it's just beating them until, until they're dead. And a lot of it has to do with, like you mentioned, people writing these regulations without ever having visited a farm, without ever having talked to a farmer. Like we're not saying that farmers need to write them, but there needs to be a better conversation about what the farmers need versus what the state wants the farmers to have. And I think that that's been kind of a big deal with, you know, people asking me, why is this such a big deal that aren't from rural areas? And I always say like, hey, you're voting on a lot of these regulations that are impacting the food that you eat. You might want to have a say in that. You might want to know what's actually going into it. And, you know, that, that's why there's been such a large push right. for um, agricultural lawyers, you know, a lot, a lot of people getting into agricultural law, as opposed to just general practice law, that way they can specialize in a lot of those regulations and have a say in them to try to speak up for the agricultural community side of things, not just whatever the, you know, the kid who just graduated from college wants to pass. And so it's, again, it, everything goes back to communication. That's, that's kind of the biggest thing in this, you know, but it also has to do with a lack of education or, or people kind of getting entitled and thinking that they know more than the people who are living it every day. I mean, the same can be said for regulations that impact people who live in impoverished areas or people who live in, you know, areas that, that are food deserts or, you know, like areas that they've never visited that they don't really understand that they have no concept of how to fix. And they're, you know, passing regulations that don't really fix them. They just kind of make them feel better. Yeah, hundred um, percent. And I don't really have anything to add on top of that because that's I mean, that that's a good way to to summarize the problem in a you know biteable chunk. Right. So, absolutely, hundred yeah. percent. So I think that kind of the the next part of the theory that I was kind of exploring was, uh, like you mentioned, it's you know as as with all things in history, it's cyclical. You know, things things kind of are are going to happen, you know, naturally over and over and over again, and we're starting to see kind of the backside of the cycle now where, where people are starting to take an interest back in agriculture. I'm, I've been trying to kind of pinpoint exactly when the split happened for, for this particular cycle. And I think I have an idea of when it started, but I don't have the best 
you know, the best way to narrow it down. I'm not sure if you, if you have any thoughts on, on when exactly this might've started. Well, let's hear your idea first. So my idea was that uh, obviously back like towards the, the end of the 1800s, you know, the 19th century, that, that was kind of when agriculture was, I would say booming, you know, in, in the sense that most families either owned a farm or, or were living near farms that most, you know, there were more rural areas than urban areas. Um, the urban areas are first starting to kind of take place because that was during the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so like, like the 1890s or early 1900s is, is kind of what I'm looking at. And I think it was towards, I would say, honestly, probably around World War II. So like the ni- like, or like early 1940s, like mid 1940s, maybe that the split first started and nobody noticed it because the war was going on. Even the farmers probably didn't even notice it. And I think it's because we put the entire country in charge of producing uh, you know, munitions for the war. You know, even like bands were, were melting down their instruments to turn them into, into casings for bullets and that sort of thing. And so it's like everybody in, in, was involved in the war effort that we industrialized so many industries that we didn't even realize were, were there yet. And I think that that caused a big boom in, in the urbanization that we didn't really expect. I mean, that was right before the baby boom. Obviously, there was there was the housing market, you know, explosion that, that happened. Uh, there was, you know, massive changes to to the economy due to the, you know, to the the crash the crash of the stock market, and because of the, in, in, you know, the introduction of a bunch of new industries. Basically, there was a lot happening in the cities, and everyone kind of forgot that the farms were there. So I think that's kind of where it started, and it got, you know, a tiny bit bigger throughout the 1950s, just because of the. Uh, you know, the introduction of the Green Revolution, which not everyone was super on board with, that was kind of the introduction of chemical fertilizers and pesticides. Um, that caused a little bit more division, but even then people didn't notice that was really happening until like the late 1900s. Um, and then we get into like the 60s, 70s era, and we have, you know, obviously the Vietnam War, we have the the quote unquote tree hugger era. You know, we have, we have a lot of people that are very environmentally focused. And at that time, agriculture was kind of in a bad spot in terms of its environmental impact. And so a lot of people were opposing it due to that. And I think from there, it just got worse and worse. And social media introducing itself kind of created a schism because all of a sudden now there was the internet and people forgot that farmers were there because they weren't on it yet. And so I think that that's kind of the timeline that I've been giving this cycle of, of the split. I'm not sure if that, you know, if that kind of lines up with what you were thinking or if you had any other ideas. I, I mean, you know, you, you clearly have a grasp on 20th century history. Hmm. Um, it, it, it passes the sniff, ch- sniff test. You know, you, you highlighted the Industrial Revolution as a major point, and that is true. Uh, the post-World War II era actually is probably the biggest Mm-hmm. boon and you know this isn't necessarily a bad thing like i i mean i wouldn't i don't think you are necessarily doing this but I, you know a lot of people might credit it as sort of a bad thing as walking away from agriculture it's like well no it's just that there wasn't as many people needed because of the new technology right because of industrialization to do to create the food needed so that people could free up and do other things um, it, it turns out when humans don't have to grow their own food they start doing other stuff uh, we see this in societies throughout history mm-hmm. so I, I think your timeline makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think, you know, the Industrial Revolution was big, sure, but I, very few things actually, no, I take that statement back. My understanding of history is a little different. <laughs> Nothing economically is quite like World War II. Right. Uh, World War II for this country was a boon. Um, which I know for many people that's an uncomfortable statement, um, but World War II for this country is a boon, and, and it and it is important to this to the advanced developments that occurred. Um, and then you know, obviously, like as time goes on, like the developments are going to pile on top. Like obviously, farming in the '60s was easier than farming in the '40s, and obviously, farming in the '80s was easier than farming in the '60s, and obviously, farming now is easier. Like that all makes sense. But like the found foundation of it, the, the threading the needle, you're going to equate the technology foundations in the Industrial Revolution, obviously, but realistically, it, it is World War II um, in the post-war that uh, drove a lot of the, the movement away from rural areas. And, th- and that's all fine and dandy. Now, you, you know, do I see it changing? Well, not necessarily. Um, I, I, I'm perhaps see a meshing of the two. There's there, at some point there's going to be a need just for logistic sense to, to start growing food in cities somehow, whether that's just urban farms as they've been called, um, whether it's, you know, on the rooftops of buildings, whether that's just people need to grow their own little balcony, cucumbers, whatever. They're, they're, we're already seeing now 
thanks to things like COVID, disruptions in supply chains make it to where the current model isn't perfect. Um, for the number of people we have that to consider, there are components of your timeline that, you know, obviously you're, you're one person. And again, it's noble. Uh, I applaud you for trying to do this on your own, but there's going to be so many outside factors. You're not going to be able to keep track of them all. Um, but something to keep in mind, you, you glossed over it um, and you, it would do you well to elaborate and flesh out and research this thought further. Um, the introduction of things like fertilizer, in, especially in the late 20th century, huge. Um, and the economic and, the economic and um, ecological impacts, also huge. Uh, the, the, the super blooms in the Gulf of Mexico, thanks to fertilizers, dumping nitrates into the water supply. Bad thing happens right. about, I think, it, I think it's nearly, but I might be misspeaking. I'm a little removed. Um, but that's also a boom, which is going to be not quite World War II. It's going to be later on. And that's something else that's going to, you know, push people away from the farms. And I don't see more people returning to farming as a lifestyle, maybe as a hobby, but not, I don't see much ag as, you know, computers to continue the revolution onto the farm. Um, AI being used to figure out where is the best place to grow, what's the best thing to grow. I, I don't know why, how many, it's wasteful. There are all kinds of more useful things we could be growing. I mean, granted, almonds are profitable, obviously, or else they wouldn't grow them. But like, I also do think that there are going to be like trends that, you know, will sort of bring it back to its roots as, you know, it becomes more computerized and then we have to worry less about profits for whatever reason, or we figure out, hey, you know, Central Valley, uh, as the dirt is becoming you can tell I'm a little outside of my sphere. As the dirt is losing its nutri nutrients and the water is becoming less plentiful, you know, maybe you know the computers will be able to tell us better than we can. You should start growing this. Mm -hmm. You know, you should start growing this this time of year. You should start. Or okay, now you know we can reintroduce nutrients. We can reintroduce uh, nitrogen and vo and um, potassium and phosphorus and all this different stuff back into the soil with these particular plants. So grow these now. And you know, as we see, as we see ag become more urban in the sense of education. Uh, with the introduction of things like computers and AI and, and um, I almost said artificial intelligence, but that's AI, machine learning, all this different buzzword stuff that people like to throw out. It, I don't see it changing. I don't see the number of people moving back and forth changing at all. So I, I would implore you to look more into the fertilizer side of it. And then the next boom, which is going to make it to where virtually nobody has to farm. I mean, percentage wise, you know, virtually nobody has to farm. It's going to be what's coming out of the current technological revolution that is the digital revolution. Right. So a couple of points on, on that. I think you're absolutely right. I think that, you know, all the points you made about, about the pesticide boom was, was definitely a big thing. Um, you know, there, there definitely is a lot more to say on that, but I just, you know, was trying to save time in, but um, yeah, no, there's, there's other, there's other aspects of that timeline too, that I think are important to include. Um, obviously the introduction, I think, I personally think the introduction of social media was a big, was a big thing for, agricultural removal and say what you will about you know social media but it is much more powerful than a lot of people oh it's think. made everything worse right and so yeah and, and so that, that i think that's been a big thing as well is that it's it's because of the introduction of like you know like you see like the videos of of you know cows getting abused and you see like you know people talking nonstop like vegans and pita were on social media long before farmers were and i'm not saying that's a bad thing but they did give farmers kind of a bad image without anyone to to defend them and so i think that that was a big part of it as they well had the head jump on the messaging right and that was kind of the big thing in the newer you know in the newer eras but back in you know back in the uh back in the 20th century when agriculture was first starting to split i think that like you mentioned the post-world war ii stuff the 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 introduction of suburbs you know just that idea of urbanization can now expand even more in in different ways and like the cookie cutter houses all that kind of stuff that basically when i was learning about world war ii in school at least i'm not sure about you but i didn't like you know back in like the back in the 19th century when we we're learning about the civil war everything had to do with agriculture every war was you know there was there was talk about farms every you know everything had to do with agriculture once we get past the industrial revolution and into world war ii i didn't hear another mention of a farm like not even you know like they talked about the suburbs and they showed us the propaganda and they showed us like the 50s baby boom and all that kind of stuff 
I didn't hear any more mention of agriculture though. You had to look for that kind of stuff. That wasn't part of your history lesson. And I think there's a reason for that. I think that that was when people started to kind of forget right. about agriculture or, or even start ignoring it in some cases. Um, so that was kind of, the, those are a couple of things I wanted. To I don't know on. if it's forgetfulness as much as it's, um, it's just no longer the dominant industry, right? Right. So if it's no longer the dominant industry, you don't you don't have to really worry about it when now the the, the issues of the new world are banking and commodity toys and all right. these different things that you couldn't a afford or reasonably make. Um, I, I, I hesitate to say forget. You know, this is I I hate this trope, but language matters. Um, so. It's less of the. It, I, I I don't think it's malice. I don't think there's malice involved. Right. I, I I think it's more that as people as as our economy, God, I'm running on fumes. <laughs> as our economy turned into the beast that it is, um, thanks in large part to a number of different factors. When you you talk about dominant industries more than anything else, so when we walked away from the farm, proverbially speaking, because we didn't need to all put in 12 hours a day to grow our own food to survive. It's just not the issue you talk about. It goes back to the whole thing like people in cities don't know about farm stuff because they don't have to worry about it. It's solved. Right. Um, well, there's so, actually a quote, and I can't remember for life me who it's by. I might need to look it up again. But it basically says that when when we have food, we have a million issues. When we don't have food, we have one issue. And it's that same mentality. Of, you know, when, when we don't have a source of food, then that's the thing we need right. to worry about. But when we have a consistent source of, of being able to produce our, our food, don't really need to worry about it much anymore. And you no, know, I think that I think that you know, to your point, mm-hmm. that's that's exactly what happened. Um, and I've you know, I've never I've never stated that you know, society tried to get rid of agriculture by any means or tried to try to ignore its existence. But I think that you're right. I think you kind of just got you know, almost not necessarily dusted under the rug, but there were other matters at hand that needed to be focused on. And I think that right. you know, when when talking about that, then we need to start talking about okay, so the split happened where is it going to go from here and what do we do about it? And so when, when getting into that conversation, I think that there's two things that you mentioned that I kind of want to touch on. Uh, one of them being the automation of agriculture, you know, the use of artificial intelligence with, with robotics, with uh, more mechanized and, and more, you know, industrial level uh, automation that can make farming a lot more efficient with a lot less workforce. Uh, currently, as it is in, in the United States, uh, less than 2% of, of Americans are actively involved in food production. And so like we are already almost at the point where next to nobody farms. I don't think that we need more farmers as necessarily. I think that we obviously are going to need people to replace the generation that exists. We do need more people that are getting involved in agriculture, but I don't think that, you know, like the, the, the entire point of, of talking about this and the entire point of me pushing people to learn more about agriculture isn't necessarily to get people to say, oh yeah, I want to go out and be a farmer because I've had people ask me all the time, like, oh, how do I go on to be a farmer? It's like, it's not that easy. You got to get land. You got to deal with the regulations. You got to get, like, there's a million and one check, you know, things on your checklist you need to finish before you even buy your first thing. And so it's, I, I never really... You know, if people want to get involved in agriculture, I always encourage them, but I never really push anybody towards that route. But I think it's more important that people are having the conversation and that they are becoming educated about their food and what's going into it rather than, you know, just kind of hope that it's all being grown okay and that, you know, and trust anything they see on Facebook about whether or not it is, it is being grown properly and all that kind of stuff. So I always, you know, I always make the claim of, I don't care if you're a farmer or not, as long as you support them. And that's, you know, that's kind of my that's where I think that the, right. that the split needs to go is in, in my opinion, at least. Right. Education solves most things. Um, and you know, I, I can roll with that. It's, it's, it's well thought out. I'll give you that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, that was a well thought out response to, to, especially to my critique. So good on you. Um, you know, you, you, you keep bringing up social media and it, it's interesting because, I think the answer, like, if you want to go that route too, because obviously it's going to get, it, it has to get more automated. Right. Uh, even if, you know, you're saying people may want to, or they need to get replaced um, in order to keep up with increasing demand, the, the industry does have to change and every industry has to change. It's not just farming. Right. You know, with the digital revolution, we've seen um, media production change. We've seen news media change. We've seen, we've seen accounting change. We're seeing, I'm watching the legal industry change right in front of my eyes. Um, we, we obviously we've seen like all the tech sectors come out of nowhere. We've seen retail change. We've seen everything has changed because of this and it has to become more digitalized. And I think, you know, another change that would be well for people to understand that they need to do as they're educating themselves on whatever topics are important to them is to actually kind of take, take a step away from social media. Um, and 
keep in mind that like Twitter is not real life. Um, famous quote by somebody I won't say the name of, but Twitter is not real life. And it's important that people recognize that, you know, some, again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. People who aren't experts need to listen to experts uh, and people who don't know what they're talking about need to shut up, um, which I would do well to do occasionally. Um, and, you know, it's just something that everyday individuals, especially while they're being educated on a topic, would do well to do. So I think that's something else that sort of has to change for this split that you seem concerned about to be to rectify itself. People need to get off of platforms, of technologies, of products that further divide them and create these splits because you you cannot learn about a farmer or about um, you know, even even you, like you can't learn about you through social media. Now you can find the links to deep dive videos that actually teach you the stuff. Um, I don't know how much SciShow does on agriculture, but like you can find links to more informative sources, right? Through YouTube, through Facebook, through Twitter and all that. But you have to focus on the sources and not the people regurgitating the sources. If I say the word GMO for most people, they're, they're going to instantly, their ears are going to perk up. Alarm bells are going off. They think it's the worst stuff in the world. When for most time it's used, it's about coloring. It's not even about like dangerous stuff. It's not dangerous at all. You know what I mean? And, and that's not even getting to the very technical definition of GMO, which is anything that we grow a certain way is technically a GMO. Like even if you just, just want to use the, the chemical side of it, it's still just like mostly color. And then when we are engineering um stuff we're, we're actually saving millions of lives you know whether it's like special rice that's solving um starvation yeah, in yeah. asia and africa so it would be best to step away from the types of technologies that make people put perk their ears up and actually go into the deep dive sources actual sources that teach about these things you know gmo is one i like to pick fun of organic is a big one i like to pick fun of too because oh, yeah. they're, they're, they're they're buzzwords that don't mean what people think they mean yeah, I, if I ha if I had to pick two things, I've gotten questions about. All more right, than so on here. what else you got? Um, uh, let's, let's see here. Yeah, no, I think that to your point, you know, the the social media, like the move away from, really, what needs to happen is there needs to be a split away from social media. That would save so many issues, but that's not going to happen for a while. I don't, I don't see. Um, I would say that the, with with the with the issue with agriculture that I've seen a lot happen too is that people get very emotionally charged when regarding the 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 process that's being that's being performed and not the farmer himself and so what, what i mean by that is you know people equate a okay. bad farmer who who has who has malpractice with the industry being corrupt basically which you know i always have to remind people there's going to be bad farmers with every industry with every practice there's going to be bad people that's just how bad people exist they're going to do bad things right there are bad priests there are bad teachers there are right. bad cops there right there's yeah. always going to be those so like you know if you see one farmer on facebook who beats his cows yeah we don't like him either you know he, he's not part of our club we don't you know we, we if we could we would you know take away his ability to farm but that's not all farmers. And so I think that that's a big thing too with social media, but moving away from, from the social media thing, cause I think we kind of, we kind of already, you know, covered that situation pretty well. I think that that, that really covers a lot of, of my thoughts on the urban, on, on the urban uh, rural split. But I think that I really kind of wanted to highlight, is this something that needs to be like, so, so as, as someone who's not actively involved in agriculture, do you think this is something that, that should be more, regularly talked about you know should, should agriculture be kind of reintroduced into mainstream conversations and kind of be on the forefront of people's minds again or is it something that you think that you don't think people should really need to worry about as much well my answer will be clouded by what's on my mind recently so mm -hmm. let me phrase it like this what i think i what, what i think i'm hearing from you um and you know the feedback i have for you so far is um, I, I think, you know, you, you talk about the rural urban split and, and then you kind of, you're trying to shoehorn farmers as the entirety of the rural side of things when I, I obviously, you know, that's not going to be true. That's I, like, it's not, I, I get that, but there, there, there are, it's, it's not that simple because it's going to, there's going to be a way because like, okay, a farmer is different than a redneck. 
right? right. Um, I grew up in a part that was more white trash than agriculture. So like, the, the, it's just, there's going to be other splits going on. Um, and, and as farming becomes more automated, becomes more intelligent, artificial intelligence, machine learning, mm -hmm. all these buzzwords, blah, 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 blah. Um, they're going to actually start to look more like the urban population than, let's say, the backwoods rednecks mm -hmm. uh, who just want to, you know, mud around. And, and there, there's different splits going on here. So even like rural, like like how I said earlier, there's different strategies of urban. There, right. There's different strategies of rural too. Yes, absolutely. So um, don't be careful in 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 oversimplifying the split is something that I would caution you on. Mm -hmm. um, as far as talking about like. All issues people need to talk about, sure. Um, I do think more people, like there are certain issues for the farming community that more people need to understand. Mm -hmm. Californians do not understand the water crisis. They do not get it. Southern Californians do not understand the stupidity that is low, just as a city. You know, where, it's, where it is, why we have to funnel water to it, and what it's doing to the land that feeds it. People just don't get it. Because they don't understand the ground in the Central Valley has sunk, mm -hmm. I think at this point, over six inches. Because there's the water just isn't there. It's being funneled to a desert, mm -hmm. a literal desert, and an unsustainable city that should be doing more for salination plants. But now I'm getting on a rant. Um, <laughs> so obviously, these are things people should talk about, yes. In communities like the Central Valley, perhaps farmers should be doing a better job of outreach. Because because that's an issue that does affect all Fresnans, whether they like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, one of the great things about Fresno, and people do not realize this, move away, you'll quickly see what I mean. The food here is cheap. It, it, it's cheap. Move to San Diego, it was more expensive. It was mm -hmm. tolerable. Um, rent will kill you down there, but you know the food was tolerable. Moved to Washington, buying dinner, it was hard. Like the, the 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 budgeting limits that I was expecting living in California to, to then moving to somewhere else, it was hard. Um, I know you know other parts of my family have been spending time in Utah. Food there is just more money. Period. Mm -hmm. It's in the middle of the desert. It's kind of unsustainable. Same sort of issue. Um, you have to truck everything there. Mm -hmm. So for regions that are ag dependent or ag is a large subsection of society, yeah, sure, by all means, know about it. Um, and obviously, the more people know, the better. Um, however, you know, there, I kind of fall into this trap and it's not on you. Uh, there are bigger fish to fry. Uh, so like I'm a political person, right? So what I see every day is people, the big story recently has been Liz Cheney on the, on the Republican side. Mm. And, and here I am just kind of like, who cares? But people fought, like go on to that. So mm -hmm. if you can pry people away from those stupid stories to actual issues, good on you. I just don't know if you can or how you would i should say you can i don't know how you would mm. um because there are bigger fish to fry you know like like i said before we got on i just got off an interview for somebody who talked an hour and a half about human trafficking that seems like a bigger fish to fry yeah. um you know and, and forgive me for commandeering a little bit but like ccp go. china all that that seems like a bigger fish to fry mm -hmm. and the same token food big deal uh your your quote I, I don't know if it's like a quote you can attribute to one person but it is true. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even in psychology, what is it? Um, is it in class is the hierarchy of needs when there's, when there's food, there's a million problems. When there's no food, there's one problem. Absolutely. Right. People need to understand that. And sure, we would be better off knowing all that. And people mm -hmm. should know more about the food. So we don't have the stupid myths we have about GMOs or about organic or about all these different things. Um, and also for, you know, other people, for perhaps the farmers to understand the concerns that surround those issues, because there are legitimate concerns that surround GMOs. And there are reasons why people prefer organic, even if it's not the scientifically smarter thing to do. There, there's like, well, there's an ethics thing here. And sure, okay, whatever, we can play with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, is it important for people to understand? Absolutely. Is it, does everybody need to understand it? No. Okay. That's fair. I, I like that response. Um, I think that because I've I've had that conversation with actually a, a friend of mine who is studying agricultural law. I think he's already graduated with his with his degree and everything. But yeah, he was actually going in for agricultural law, and he was actually looking to tackle the water crisis. That was that was like one of his main goals. So him and I used to debate a little bit because I uh, we both learned how to how to speak. You know, we we both went through the same public speaking training program basically. And he's a much better speaker than I am. And so we would, we would constantly like, he would come in and kind of like judge my speaking and kind of help coaching me all that kind of stuff. 
we used to have conversations about that exact thing. You know, basically, is it worth investing any time into teaching others about agriculture? Like, does it matter? And basically, he would always argue the water situation is more important. I was like, well, of course, the water situation is more important. But which one are you going to have an easier time fixing? You know, like the the education system. That's or not the education system, but like the you know the the the, the method through which we teach people about agriculture that's an easy problem to fix that could solve a lot of issues. The water situation, that's going to take a lot longer with a lot more effort that we really don't have the access to right now because we're kind of up against an entire army of, you know, of, of people, you know, metaphorically speaking, when it comes to the water situation. Um, but, you know, we, we used to talk about that and he always kind of couldn't see the point in focusing on teaching others about agriculture or kind of, you know, focusing on the rural urban split, kind of like uh, even, you know, in, in the instance that you mentioned where there's like layers to the rural and, and urban communities that he couldn't see the value in that, which I understand that there are definitely larger issues that are, that are more important and worth worrying about. But the way I've always looked at it has been, if you can fix the issue, then you should worry about it. If you can't do anything about it, then sure, you should, you should kind of have it on your mind, but really what are you going to do to fix it? Like education yeah. is something that, that almost anyone who knows something about that topic can help with fixing. And so like, I've always kind of, you know, messed around with the idea. And I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this about incorporating agriculture into, um, into schools more, more consistently. So like not just having it as an elective, but out, but also having, having it as a class that, is either required, you know, for a year or something that, that is more heavily influenced into people's, into, into people's schedules, or at least more, you know, expose them to it more throughout their, throughout their school experience. And just see if that kind of mitigates some of the reason to even have these conversations, because like, let's just say, you know, the water issue or the human trafficking issue, or, you know, like the regulations or anything like that. How many of those issues can you fix by teaching that to somebody in school? Like, you know, those are issues that are, are very large and societal issues that need to be fixed. People knowing where our food comes from and that they should trust GMOs, that's something that I don't feel like we should be talking about on a societal level. That's something we should be kind of knocking out when they're when they're younger and, and you know, we should be learning that stuff anyways. People should know where their food comes from. I think that's the extent of, like, we're, we're talking 300 and some odd million people, right? So right. If, if you, if everybody knew the basics, and I'm talking like the basic basics of right. where their food comes from and actually sort of understood that, that would be huge for what you're trying to do. Um, I, you're not going to get Chicago to right. dedicate a, a class for a year of 12 years to agriculture. So I don't know if that's the answer. I also have a hard time. Now I'm letting my, now I'm showing my cards a little bit, but I think it's probably towards the end of the show. So it's okay. That's I have fine. a hard time with the government. Just um, I think there are other ways to achieve the same goal that are probably simpler. I, I like, for, for instance, if you stuck me in an ag course, I don't care. Um, and, and that's not because it's bad. It's just like after you, after, and I had the, you know, the, the plants and stuff, the plant biology and the basics explained to me through various different means. I don't need to know what, what did you say earlier? AI cow. I don't need to know what that means. Right. So it, it depends on what you're kind of saying. Like now, should people know where their food comes from? Sure. We've seen lots of, we actually, there was a pretty comical example in the last year, um, I shouldn't. There was a pretty comical example in the last year uh, where somebody, a group of people tried to grow food and it was pretty clear they didn't have any idea what they were doing. Um, basics, you know, they, they put, they put, if I get the story right, tarp, dirt, mm -hmm. seeds, water. Why isn't it working? Oh, I, I know what you're referring to. <laughs> okay. But like, yes, yes and, and people need to understand the basics. So if you, if you say, hey, I want you're kind of sort of saying bring back home ec in a weird way. Mm. Um, you know, I want a biology course or even a social science course to dedicate two weeks to the basics of farming. Right. For whether that's for social science, for society or biology, just how food works. And that it's not a week long thing. It's like a year and a half type of process with, multi, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Absolutely. P people should know where the food comes from. And if people know where food comes from, that gets rid of a lot of stigma. Um, as far as like, you, you, you mentioned stamping out GMO misconceptions and stuff like that. Um, I, I got a better solution for you because okay. this is something where I actually do feel I'm, I'm versed enough to actually speak on this intelligently. Okay. Uh, the GMO issue, and by extension, in a weird way, the organic issue mm -hmm. is not the farmer's fault. Right. 
believe it or not. It's not even the consumer's fault, actually. It's the damn scientists. Uh, because scientists have this incessant need to feel smart and so they say big words and they can't be wrong so they're hyper technical on words that you don't understand that I don't understand. I have a BS in biology. I still don't understand it. Um, and, and then, you know, this gets filtered down to everyday people in everyday people speak. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not, that's not, and I don't say that to be elitist. It's just, it is what it is. Right. Um, it, it, it leads to a lot of confusion. So when I say we're genetically modifying organisms um, by altering their DNA, um, people take that and say, so you can turn it into whatever. And it's like, well, no, but I can make the apples red or I can make it to where they take up more vitamin K from the ground and now there's just more vitamin K in the food and now people in, who have that deficiency can survive. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it gets over complicated by scientists and then when it gets filtered down, it's not dumbed down. Um, for lack of a better term, in a way that makes sense, so then it gets taken and, ran, and it gets ran off with. I don't think you can solve that problem at the elementary school or middle school or high school level outside of teaching critical thinking. Um, but you know, I, if you want to look for a solution to that sphere of the issues, don't blame the farmers. Don't even blame the hippies. Well, you know. Yeah, no, I I think that you're absolutely. I don't know right. if it's my connection cutting out or yours. So. I, it might be mine. My connection gets kind of wonky at night, but okay, okay, you can hear me, okay? Yeah, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, no, I think I think that you know that that's a solid point that you know for one, like like you said that you know a lot of I think that I think not just with GMOs but with, with a lot of like kind of newer methods of agriculture and newer technologies, even like regenerative agriculture. You know, which is largely a, a, a agreed to be a, to be a, a beneficial thing. Both sides are kind of rejecting it just because they don't really know enough about it because it's really explained weirdly. And so I think that like I can, I, guess, I guess kind of the most yep. simplistic way, just so I don't ramble like I, like I usually do, uh, that I want to explain this is that I don't think that like I've said forever, we need to be having better conversations about our food. I don't think that we should be having conversations about our food. I think that that should be taught to us before we should be worried about it if that makes sense so like like you know like you mentioned there are bigger fish to fry yeah our food should not be something that we should be arguing over you know that should be something we should just all know about and we kind of just agree is is a good thing we're just gonna kind of let it happen because like i don't think people should worry about how their food is being grown because I, th I trust the agricultural process i think if people want to worry about it and want to talk about it that's great but we're having massive debates and discussions over food when really these are things that we should have learned when we were kids or that we were in high school or whatever. Like, you know, I don't really know why people are, are freaked out about a lot of the stuff that's going on in agriculture when that's not something that they should really be concerned about because it's for one out of their control. And for two, it's not as bad as they're thinking it is in the first place. So I just, I think that at the end of the day, my, my big thing is yes, there are bigger fish to fry. That's why this should be taken out right now. You know, that's why we should just knock this out of the way. That way it's not even worry, you know, worth worrying about anymore. That's a good way to put it. I like it. Awesome. So, I mean, that kind of wraps up all the thoughts I had. I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add to that or any other thoughts of your own. I will say it's... Okay, for the listener, we don't know each other. Right. Uh, we met online. And it, it you've impressed me, honestly. Mm -hmm. you, you clearly know you know more than I do about this type of stuff. So it, um, I'm not going to talk on your territory. You clearly know more than I do. Uh what I, I think you have a good grasp on what you're trying to tackle. I beware oversimplification. Hmm. Um, this, some of the issue, I guess I will say like, you know, pick an issue and kind of stick with it. Um, you, you're trying to tackle everything at once and that's noble and all that. And I run into the same problem, but like, um, some like, you know, just even with the law, it gets so complicated and so convoluted that, you can be an attorney for 20 years and still not quite get it. Um, don't, don't get discouraged when the, 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 un the untied strings, you know, start to fall apart because that's mm -hmm. going to happen. Um, you clearly know your stuff. You've impressed me, which I, I get, this is not thoughts. I'm like, you're asking me, what do I think about the split? The split you've, you've handled it quite well. And I fleshed out most of what I think that's useful for this conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, but you've impressed me. I think you clearly know what you're, you're going to take this conversation. You're going to flesh it out. You're going to find new insights and you you clearly have the tools and have already done the research you need to do to have 
intelligent conversations about this, which is much more than I can say for the average podcaster um, that I've talked to. So good on you for that. Um, here's where I like, if I want to like leave people with something, your notion that like, again, people should know where the food comes from. I think you solve that. You solve most of your issues, which maybe that's what you need. You know, the simple solution, that's it right there. People should know where their food comes from. Um, and, and, you know, just understand it's not tarps plus dirt, plus seed, plus water, plus weak. Like you, it, it's not that simple. Um, and, you know, stay respectful of the differences. And this isn't towards you. This is to the listener, generally speaking, stay respectful to people who know more than you um, and let and take their insights before making decisions about their field, uh, which I think society would do well to listen more to farmers. Uh, being a Fresno, farmers are in California are misunderstood, ignored. Um, they're not a large voting block. That's for political reasons that I tried not to get into here. It's not my show. Um, you know, and that's unfortunate because although they are a minority group uh, from a political voting block point of view, um, they are they are exceptionally important. And I agree with you, they are a group that needs to be taken very seriously, if for nothing else, so that us Californians can enjoy our avocado toast. That's important. Awesome. So, yep. Great. Well, I appreciate the kind words. You know, I definitely have some revisions I need to make to my theory after hearing your comments. I mean, that's, that's kind of the whole purpose of this. I mean, I'm sure you, you could kind of imagine I awesome. went into this with, help. yeah, I went into this with some kind of preconception of what I believed. And I will, you know, the entire purpose of having other people, cause I could have just talked about this by myself, kind of shared my thoughts with the audience, but it's a lot more beneficial to have somebody here to kind of bounce ideas back and forth with, to kind of edit my ideas and kind of tell me like, Hey, I think you you've got it, but here's some tweaks or no, you're completely off the mark. This is, you know, this is not what's happening in the world. And so I'm glad that at least somebody else, you know, semi agrees with me and doesn't think I'm crazy. That's always a nice thing to hear. Um, but I, I think that, you know, it, it's, it's nice to have somebody to, to converse with that seems to have a pretty strong handle on how these, you know, these types of issues are, you know, need to be handled, why, why these types of conversations are needing to be had and that kind of stuff. But as much as I enjoy getting into politics, I, I appreciate that, you know, that you're able to kind of keep things more on, on topic than, than the political motivations behind things, which is a whole other conversation that we can get into another time. Um, whole different conversation maybe i can bring you on my show we can talk about that hey that'd be great i i love talking politics especially agricultural politics as a whole thing um but yeah so i think that that's kind of you know that helps me a lot and i think that 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 was a good way to kind of kick off this mini series that i'm working on that gives me a lot to write, kind of think about i've been kind of think, thinking about doing something like once I finish with the mini series, creating almost like a YouTube like series, just kind of summarizing all of my thoughts and creating like the final thought of, of what the, what the theory is. I don't know if that like, as like another content creator, I'm not sure if that sounds like something that I think would be interesting, but I don't know. I think that might kind of play yeah, with that. Absolutely. I mean, the more you do, the better. Yeah. So that being said, that kind of closes out all the thoughts that I had uh, before we close out. Uh, I would like to give you the chance to plug all your stuff again, remind people where they could find you and all that. Yeah, now now I have to show my cards. <laughs> um, so my name is Taylor Eland. Yeah, my name is Taylor Eland. I, I run a political podcast. Uh, it's a la the American right. I know it's a boogeyman term, I understand. And, and conservative in California. Whoa, what a, what a weird concept. Uh, you can find it, you know, it's called Contrarix, Contrarix.com, C-O-N-T-R-A-R-I-X.com. It's a play off the word contrarian because that's just how my brain works uh we, we you know uh, we exam the mission statement is basically examining the big tent of american conservatism uh he, my co-host is elected official down in san diego county uh, he represents more the, t the typical republican line i am a i would call myself a, a conservative but i would have to flesh out what that term means because it's not what you think it means listener um and, and you know i to put it into more colloquial speak i'm a centrist with a libertarian streak um, if I were to pick my utopia that can never be achieved, it would be the libertarian one. Um, but there's a role for government. It's important and it's important. And we have to direct it in certain ways. Uh, so centrist with libertarian streak. We examine the big tent of conservatism. This month, the entire month of May, I guess I don't know when this is being replaced, but the entire month of May, I'm doing a mini series on China and the CCP uh, because it's an issue that people don't understand and need to understand. Uh, you know, I, I alluded to bigger fish to fry. In my mind, that's a big fish to fry. 
And, you know, I've had anywhere from firsthand testimonial of seeing um, women being bussed into a stadium for God knows what reason in China, all the way to experts who have their PhDs in Chinese uh, history and China and China as a whole um, talk about, you know, the recent history of China, what makes the CCP what it is. So it's, that's what I've been doing this month. And we do all kinds of topics that range the political spectrum and range all kinds of ideas. Um, and what I shared with um, you before we started was I just got off another interview that was an hour and a half of human trafficking, which is a heavy subject. So if you want some different political commentary from the American right, that's not a Ben Shapiro clone, check it out. Um, again, it's called Contrarics. You can find it at Contrarics on Instagram, Contrarics on YouTube. Uh, there's all kinds of other places to find me, Contrarics.com. But that's a long spiel, and I appreciate you letting me ramble about it for a moment. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely be, be checking it out. I know that my audience tends to be pretty diverse in terms of their in terms of their political standings. I have a lot of people from the right, from the left, from the middle, all over the place. I tend to kind of identify closer to where you are in terms of the political spectrum. So I think that'd be something that I'd be interested in checking out. But yeah, I appreciate you uh, taking the time to you know, to, to come on here and talk about all, you know, all that stuff with me. It definitely helped me a lot. I think it helped my audience kind of get a good foundation for what my thoughts are and kind of where this theory is eventually going to end up. Um, but yeah, so I, I, you know, thanks again so much for taking the time to do this. I know that you're probably tired after three recording sessions. I know that I am, but um, yeah, we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. So thanks again so much, Taylor. Thanks to all the audience for tuning in, for listening, and for all the support over the, over, you know, the, the time that I've, I've been doing this. And hope to catch all of you next week. And don't forget, if you ate today, thank a farmer. 